The puffin comes to the mouth of the Bay of Fundy to raise its young. The humpback whale comes to feed on herring that have come to spawn. The North Atlantic right whale and its seven-month-old calf come to nurse. This may be the rarest whale in the world. From May to October, a wonderful diversity of life inhabits the mouth of the Bay of Fundy, a fertile marine oasis off Canada's Atlantic coast. Most of the ocean is an aquatic desert, and virtually all marine life depends on small, food-rich oases, like the mouth of the Bay of Fundy. On the surface, these vital oases seem no different from the surrounding ocean, but they have to be unusually fertile to attract animals from all over the Atlantic. The finback whale has come from wintering grounds off North Carolina. the greater shearwater from nesting colonies off southern Africa. White-sided dolphins chase schools of fish in from the open Atlantic, and razor-billed auks migrate from the Grand Banks to breed. The food-rich waters at the mouth of the bay are created by huge tides funneling in from the Atlantic. More water surges through the mouth of the bay than the combined outflow of North America's ten largest rivers. Wherever tidal currents create upwellings of water, they carry nutrients from the seafloor up into the summer light. This enriched water grows immense blooms of phytoplankton, microscopic plants that are the essential first link in the marine food chain. Phytoplankton forms 99% of all plant life in the sea. Phytoplankton turns the water into a murky broth that will feed tiny plant grazers. Copepods drift in huge swarms. The flea-sized crustaceans nourish on extraordinary variety of animals. Both the 60-ton right whale and the tiny storm petrel feed almost exclusively on copepods. The shrimp-like krill also eat copepods, and it is krill that draws many animals to the mouth of the bay. Krill sometimes form large slicks at the surface. This can set off a feeding frenzy. attack krill from below, and seabirds dive for both krill and fish. Finback and humpback whales can eat a half ton of krill at one feeding. One hundred meters down, krill feed important commercial fish species like pollock and cod.
At depths below 20 meters, it's too dark to grow phytoplankton, and the primary food source is plant and animal debris, constantly raining down from above. Tidal currents will carry nutrients back to the surface to fertilize phytoplankton, and the cycle of life begins again. We take an average of 130,000 tons of fish per year out of the Bay of Fundy, the greatest amount of any predator. To grow just one cod, the bay must produce 30 tons of phytoplankton. Like other creatures, fishermen depend on the fertile oases in the sea. Razor-billed auks and puffins spend most of their lives on the open ocean, and while tied to their breeding colonies at Machaya Seal Island, they depend on the food-rich waters of the bay. While raising their young, seabirds are extremely vulnerable to predators, and our ancestors used to eat their eggs and kill the birds for meat. Audubon painted the great auk, not long before it was hunted to extinction in the 1840s. He also painted the puffin and the razor-billed auk, and speculated that they might share its fate. About 1850, feathers of every kind became the rage, and by 1900, many seabirds have been exterminated over much of their range. Many of the puffins, razorbills, and arctic terns, still remaining south of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, breed at the mouth of the bay on Machaya Sea Island. The island has long been the focus of boundary disputes between Canada and the U.S., and now wildlife tours quarrel over bird watching rights. Arctic terns defend their territory by attacking the 25 bird watchers allowed on the island at one time. Terns raise two chicks a year, and to feed them, one of the adults is always fishing. If fish are scarce, the terns spend extra time and energy searching for food. The adults must eat more of the catch, and there is less for the chicks. Once airborne, this tern chick may fly the greatest distance of any bird migrating as far south as Antarctica. Follow hunters no longer threaten this breeding colony, 
it is vulnerable to changes in the local food supply. Both puffins and razorbills have only one chick a year, and if food is very scarce, a colony will lose most of its young. This happened in Newfoundland in 1981, where about 90% of the puffin chicks failed to survive through their first year. Extensive shallows have formed at the mouth of the bay, and the energy of waves, tides, and the sun turns them into undersea gardens. Like phytoplankton, seaweeds are a primary food source of the bay. Seaweeds also provide shelter for breeding animals and protect the young from predators. Juvenile lobsters hide among the rocks and seaweed. Wolffish migrate from deep water to lay their eggs. Pollock come inshore to grow before returning to the open sea. Black guillemots breed along the shoreline and feed on small fish in the shallows. The guillemot lays a tasty egg, and a century ago they were sold as a delicacy on the Boston market. Today, only herring gulls attempt to steal this treat. Swarms of juvenile herring swim to the shallows to graze on phytoplankton. Herring are a staple food for many creatures, including a small population of harbor seals that summer on the reefs and shoals. Harbor seals damage fishing gear and will steal the catch. So until recently, there was a $10 bounty for each seal killed. Last year, the bounty on harbor seals was removed because the population is considered too small to cause serious damage. As for all marine animals, the seal's effect on human welfare continues to determine its fate. Fishermen harvest the shallows by using an ancient and ingenious maze called a weir to catch herring. When the weir blocks the herring's path, they instinctively follow the straight fence into the heart-shaped corral. Once inside, they follow the curving fence that always leads away from the opening. The net lining the inside of the weir is drawn shut at the bottom trapping the herring. As the net is hauled in, the herring are forced into an ever smaller space. A vacuum hose pumps the herring into the boats.
The herring gull is one of the only seabirds to have increased dramatically in recent decades. The gull is like the rat. It adapts to human activity and has a taste for human leftovers. The tides flow in and out of the salt marsh, circulating nutrient-rich water to the plants. Acre for acre, salt marshes are the most fertile areas in the marine environment. Spartina grass is the most abundant marsh plant, yielding two to three times the growth of an equivalent wheat field. Spartina grass is too tough to be eaten until it decomposes. Plant grazers, like the snail, feed on the rotting Spartina. They, in turn, are eaten by predators. Beginning in late July, up to 50,000 shorebirds arrive at the mouth of the bay on their annual migration from the northern breeding grounds. The marshes are an important stopover for the semi-palmated sandpiper. Each bird eats voraciously and will store enough fat for it to fly non-stop to South America. The ruddy turnstone finds a meal by flipping rocks instead of competing for the heavily used mud flats of the marsh. A marine environment can only grow so much food, and each animal has evolved special ways to get its share. When two animals interfere with each other, competition for food turns into conflict. A humpback whale has chased herring into a weir and can't find its way out. A diver has to be sent down to cut the netting and set the whale free. Local people are curious to see this rare whale, but to the weir's owner, it is a disastrous situation. The season is short, the catch has been poor, and the whale may be scaring off schools of herring worth over $10,000. The weirs have suffered poor catches in recent years because of overfishing by modern herring fleets out in the bay. For many fishermen, the weirs are no longer even worth operating. The whale and the weir are now free of each other, but in the long run, neither can compete with new fishing technologies. Able to catch every herring the bay can produce, modern fleets were a real threat to many communities and many creatures at the mouth of the bay. In murky waters, 
white-sided dolphins transmit clicking sounds to locate schools of herring. The clicking sounds echo back to the dolphins when they hit the fish, revealing the species, location, and speed of their prey. Instead of using ears, the dolphin picks up the clicking sounds through a specially designed forehead and lower jaw. This unique adaptation gives the animal a hearing system that is among the best in the world. men represent a new industry at the mouth of the bay. It profits from the growing fascination for dolphins and whales. Their exuberant behavior makes humpbacks a star attraction. But most people come here to see one of the rarest whales in the world. By 1100, the North Atlantic right whales were being hunted by the Basques off the coast of Spain. A superior lamp oil could be made from the whale fat, and a highly profitable new industry got underway. Reaching 19 meters in length and a weight of 60 tons, the right whale is slow swimming, rarely sinks when killed, and would yield up to 11,000 liters of precious oil. To early whalers, it was the true or right whale to kill. By 1600, the Basques were killing right whales off Labrador. Colonial New England was built on profits from the hunt. By the 1860s, the right whale was so rare that drawings of stranded specimens were made to convince skeptical zoologists of its existence. In the 1930s, the hunt was finally banned but by this time, the right whale had almost vanished from the North Atlantic. This tragedy isn't just a chronicle of abuse by the whaling industry. The right whale story also illustrates the greatest danger now facing all creatures at the mouth of the bay, the destruction of the fertile oases in the ocean. In spite of 50 years of protection, less than 300 right whales survive in the North Atlantic. Since 1981, researchers from the New England Aquarium photographed over 100 right whales at the mouth of the bay. Each whale can be recognized by the craggy skin patches on its head called callosities. The shape is different for each animal, and they are found only on right whales. The researchers have identified this right whale and named her Fermata. Last winter, she was photographed off Florida with a newborn calf, and after migrating 2,000 kilometers, the pair now arrives at the mouth of the bay in late July. Fermata's calf is affectionately known to the research team as Half Note. At seven months old, 
The baby is already 29 feet long and weighs about six tons. Note is one of nine new calves sighted this year, and the mouth of the bay appears to be the main summer nursing area for right whales in the North Atlantic. The curious calf plays round the research boat, while the mother makes 15-minute dives to feed on copepods. Whalers used to kill the calf to lure the mother within harpooning distance. In spite of 50 years of protection and healthy young calves like Half Note, the right whale has failed to make a dramatic recovery. This alarming situation is probably due to the loss of most right whale habitats along the densely populated U.S. coast. The few remaining habitats, like the mouth of the bay, may only be able to support a small population of the whales. The right whale's predicament exemplifies the greatest danger now facing all life that depends on the fertile oases in the ocean. We can't preserve marine life unless we preserve places like the mouth of the bay. They are the source of both the abundance and the extraordinary diversity of life in the sea. <laughs>